Hello everyone. So, we're now going to look at renormalization in the context of quantum mechanics. This lecture is going to be based on the lecture notes I found uh, by Marcus Luti of UC Davis. Full credits to him for coming up with this example. And I strongly recommend whoever is listening or watching this to go read those notes. Now, the reason why I wanted to cover this part of the broader story there is because it really tells us that the set of techniques that go under the name of free normalization isn't simply about chopping away infinities, which is what you might be led to believe when you encounter it for the first time in quantum field theory, or from hearing what people have to say about it sometimes, but more so about parametrizing our ignorance of physics at distances shorter than our theories can properly explain. So, in order to find ourselves in this kind of a dicey situation, let's consider quantum mechanics in one dimension with a potential that is short-ranged. Let's call little a the length over which the potential varies. And we will consider probing this potential with quanta of sufficiently long wavelength, long de Broglie wavelength, which in turn means that we're going to consider quanta with momentum eigenvalues much smaller than A inverse. And the Schrodinger equation here takes the standard time-independent form with a Hamiltonian given by a sum of kinetic and potential pieces. The particularly interesting case that we'll be considering here will be the one where v is an odd function of space. Normally, where we're given the f explicit form of the solution, we'll consider an ansatz of the following form for the wave function. And in pictures, this looks like the following, where we have some amplitude for an incoming wave, a transmitted wave, and a reflected one. From computing these quantities, these amplitudes a, b, and c, we can infer the transmission coefficient, the reflection coefficient, or amplitude, and by unitarity, they're related in the following way. So it suffices just to compute one of them. Now, by considering waves of de Broglie wavelength sufficiently large compared to the range over which the potential varies, we might as well approximate these short-range potentials as distributions. Now, were we considering an even function of space, then we could just use the Dirac delta function for our distributional potential. But if we had to consider an odd function of space, then we will need the derivative of the delta function. So, a note on what these constants c and c1 are. So, we could extract them in principle where we given an explicit potential and did something akin to the multipole expansion in electrodynamics to infer what these are. But, if we're to just probe our potential with quanta of very long wavelength, then what we'll have to do is infer them, treat them as coupling constants, like we would in quantum field theory. But let's plant a flag, flag there and come back to it towards the very end, because this is an important point. So to see the issues that arise with an odd function of space being our potential, let's take a look at the S matrix that describes the kind of scattering that we're interested in. Now the S matrix is related to the following unitary operator that in the interaction picture dictates the time evolution of our states. It's given by the time ordered exponential of the integral of the interaction Hamiltonian, which is defined in the following way. And we obtain the S matrix 
by taking the interval of time to infinity. So the S matrix de defines the propagation of asymptotic states defined at very early times to those defined at very late times. And Dyson taught us that we can obtain this quantity in perturbation theory through the following series. So the leading order contribution is just the matrix elements of the potential, provided energy is conserved. Note that if the potential were zero, if our particles were free, then the initial and final asymptotic states are identical. That just means that these particles fly right through each other. And we have a first or second order contribution coming from the following momentum integral. I'll just demarcate each of these so that we can refer to them in the following slide. So now let's consider what happens when we have an approximation for an even short range potential. The first order contribution gives us a constant. Second order contribution is an integral over momentum that converges. However, if we have an odd potential, the first order contribution is momentum dependent, the second order contribution diverges. So, if we pay close attention to the form of this integral, we'll see that the issue really arises at very large momenta. This breakdown of our Dyson series is reflected in the fact that we could perhaps try and solve the Schrodinger equation with a, de a derivative of delta function potential, only to find that no solution exists. To see how this is, we can integrate the equation over space around x equals zero, obtain the following difference equation, and we would normally impose continuity and jump conditions to then go and infer our amplitudes. The issue is that psi prime at zero is ill-defined because it's discontinuous there. Now, we have encountered our simple version of an ultraviolet divergence. So in our example, this issue is an ultraviolet issue because it happens at small length scales, at short length scales, or at very large momenta. This is exactly how it would occur in quantum field theories too. And like in quantum field theory, what we can do is introduce a short distance cutoff. And we can approximate our potential now as a difference of delta functions by introducing this parameter a. Now, when we take a to zero, we recover our derivative of delta function. a here is a short distance cutoff which I've only named suggestively to be the same as the range over which the potential varies, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this length scale. So long as the wavelengths of the quanta we're interested in are sufficiently large in comparison, then A could be anything else. So now we could try to make an ansatz to solve the cutoff problem, where again we consider some superposition of incoming and reflected waves all the way to the left, and in the middle where the potential varies, we have a different superposition of incoming and transmitted waves, so incoming and reflected waves, and all the way to the right we have a purely transmitted wave. Now, the curious among the listeners might want to go and do this exercise explicitly and find that 1 over the transmission amplitude is given by the following function of a and p. Note that this would diverge as a goes to zero. But we could consider momenta that are sufficiently small in comparison to 1 over a, and we would find that the transmission coefficient is given by the following ratio. And 
now we're ready to do the next step, which is the step of renormalization. So here we have a drum roll, and we get to just define the ratio of A over C1 squared as C sub R, which is the renormalized coupling. And then we obtain the following result that's independent of the cutoff. Now, we could say that this is a bit bizarre, because all we've really done is introduced another variable. But the point of C sub R is that we can hold it fixed, provided that we adjust A and C1 in compensatory ways. C1 is something that we would obtain from what we would normally call the bear theory. So we would have to do the expansion, the multiple expansion of our potential explicitly to find what it is. But if we only had access to quanta of sufficiently low momentum, then all we can really do is infer from the transmission coefficient what C sub R is as a phenomenological parameter. And then for our purposes, we would be perfectly capable of describing scattering over this potential. So C sub R is really parametrizing the sensitivity of the system to the physics at short distances. And furthermore, it's an admission of ignorance of the detailed physics at short distances, provided we only have quanta of very large wavelength to probe the system with, in particular very large in comparison to this cutoff. So really renormalization is not so much about cancelling infinities as much as it is about a sort of relativity of scales. And that perspective was really brought to us from the study of critical phenomena, where all of a sudden, we find that systems no longer care about the scale at which you probe them. Start to see the behavior, start to see scale invariant behavior. And in particular, the kinds of models you would encounter in your education are those like the Ising model. And you can try and look at phase transitions that they exhibit. And near the critical point, particular second-order critical points, is where you start to see this behavior of scale invariance emerging. And of course, there's a high-energy physics um, parallel to all of this, which is that our running coupling constants describe how interactions are screened as we vary the energy of the particles that are undergoing scattering. And really, how we can make sense of this procedure for normalization comes from thinking about certain renormalization group flows on the space of theories, which applies very broadly across statistical mechanics, quantum field theory and high energy physics, and even astrophysics and cosmology. So. In the following videos, we'll try and explore the idea of the renormalization group a little bit further. Try and understand how exactly we can make sense of a theory of relativity of scale. Till then, stay tuned.